Hello, welcome back to Miner Network. I'm at Beaver Creek and I'm joined with Alex Suchinik, the CEO over at Nova Royalty. Alex, good to see you again. Thank you very much, Peter. Great to be here. Uh, for those less familiar, just a quick overview. What's the company? Uh, we are a copper and nickel royalty company. Uh, we started up in 2018 with a very simple idea. Uh, we wanted to create the world's best copper investment. We thought copper would be the central commodity of the energy transition, uh, with really being the key driver of every major application from EVs to wind to solar to all the associated infrastructure. And we really saw a generational opportunity to create a first mover royalty company focused on the, ne ne the next generation of major copper assets. And that's exactly what we've done. So fast forward four years, we own the royalties on really a critical mass of the most important copper projects coming online this decade. They're already, already being advanced by major operators like First Quantum, uh, Tech, um, Hot Bay, uh, Glencore, Anglo, etc. So we're really excited about what that means for Nova. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really great when you start a company and then you, know, you have a business plan in the beginning. Um, and then you know, the only way to get the royalties on these top-notch assets is you cannot walk into the companies themselves. You know, we reached out to the, origin, to, to the families that are the, the descendants of the, of the discoverers of the original assets. And when these assets were sold to the majors, those when the royalties were created as a part of the deal. Um, so oftentimes the royalty has been in, in the family for 30, 40 years, and we built the relationships with these families who then sold the assets into Nova, often for shares. Um, so it's really been great to see the company's growth. Uh, we listed two years ago. Uh, we went public on the TSX Venture Exchange. Um, it's been a great run for our shareholders since. Current market cap is approximately $150 million Canadian, and um, it's really just the beginning. Um, and so we're excited about the opportunities going forward. I think, I think this is the key point here is that the assets that you have are owned by world-class operators, and they're, they're all pushing these genuinely some of the largest copper and nickel assets in the world. And somehow, Absolutely. and th th this is credit to you, that you've managed to bypass going through the mining companies, obviously go straight to the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the actual owners of, of the royalties, the past generations. Yes. That, that's, I wanted to dig down and, and dig a bit deeper on the actual assets themselves, because the, like I said, they are world-class. And it's, so I guess we're, Without ranking them, but let's actually run through the asset portfolio, if you don't mind. What what, what are the the projects and the royalties that excite you at the moment that you that you currently own? So we have a portfolio of twenty two royalties. Um, I would say that um, it's really sort of the top six, which form the the, the core of the value of the company. Um, so it's Taka Taka First Quantum. Uh, so we own uh, zero point four two percent NSR uh, on the asset. First Quantum has guided to a production decision in two thousand twenty four. Um, so the first stage mine plan is uh, 32 years. Um, if you just look at the current copper price and you assume only the first stage mine plan, our royalty revenue and the aggregate would be over $200 million. Uh, just, just from the royalty alone. And again, I mean, the, these, these, these mines, they are much larger than the initial plan because nobody sinks four to five billion dollars and invests this kind of capital to just do, uh, have stage one. Um, and that's really the attraction for us. So we, we typically come in and buy those royalties say five to seven years before production is scheduled to commence. And that's really the ideal meeting point for us and the family that owns the royalty where they can monetize it for a reasonable sum. And then Nova also has enough comfort that the asset is advancing and it really creates a great opportunity for both of us. Um, we also own a royalty on the Jose Maria project, which is Lundin Mining. And that's clearly their next major greenfield asset, which they're going to construct. And again, when you look at that camp in San Juan, which has Jose Maria and Philo, and then you go to the other side, um, you have Gelados. This is truly one of the great copper camps of the world. And I believe they call it the Vicuña. So we're very excited about that asset as well. Uh, we own the royalty on the Copper World Complex in Arizona, which is Hot Bay Minerals. Um, they've just put out a PEA um, in June of this year. Um, they're working on a PFS right now, getting to a feasibility study next year, and the construction decision as early as 2024. And that would be a, a, one of the preeminent copper camps in the United States. Uh, we own a producing royalty called Aranza, on, the, on the mine called Aranza Zoo in Mexico. Uh, which is owned by a company called Order Minerals, which is controlled by the Brito family, which founded Yamana. Um, really one of the best performing mid-sized copper mines um, in, in, in our sector. Aranza Zoo is clearly sort of the major cash generating, generating asset of Aura. Um, and we're fortunate to have 1% NSR. Uh, we picked up the royalty last August uh, from a third party seller. Um, it saw three quarters of record production since that acquisition, so it's great to be in that position where you see such a great performance by the company. This royalty currently covers about two-thirds of our G&A cost, um, and which I think 
kind of is, is a great help to the company as the bulk of our portfolio really moves to our production in the second half of this decade. Uh, we also own a royalty on the Biscachitos project in Chile, uh, which is uh, owned by Los Andes Copper, which if you follow the, the junior mining market is clearly one of the best regarded developers out there. I mean, again, you know, we live in a world with a scarcity of legitimate tier one assets. and. Vizcachitas is clearly one of the handful of legitimate tier one assets in the good jurisdiction in the middle of Chile's second largest copper belt along next to some of the world's biggest mines, and Dina, Pilampres, Los Bruns. So you have all the infrastructure there, you have the mining know-how, you have the culture. Um, you know, we also own the royalty on the other major greenfield asset in that belt called the West Wall. It's uh, about 15, 20 kilometers away from Vizcachitas. It's owned by Glencore and Anglo-American. Um, and so we're excited to really be in that camp with the two largest, most advanced greenfield deposits in the area. So again, when you look at the portfolio Nova has, you know, we really do own uh, royalties in the critical mass of the next set of major deposits. Um, there's a great opportunity for us now in the market uh, as well, because you are seeing some stress and you know, we're focused on adding some cash flowing and near term cash flowing royalties to the portfolio to balance well, this, things out. This is one of the next things I wanted to talk to you about with the show. But before we go on to that, I mean, with the current price environment that we're in at the moment, I think we're around well, it's 350 copper, around $10, $10 nickel. Um, are, these, are the mines that you currently own a royalty on, are they economic in this sort of price environment or do you need higher prices to, to, to receive a rate of return on this? These mines can be built even at this price because you are dealing with very much the top end of the sector. Um, however, I do think just because every miner is being a bit more cautious in the capital allocation, you know, you're probably going to see, you know, kind of things naturally progress at a pace that people can, can stomach. Um, at the same time, if you listen to anyone in the sector, nobody thinks 350 is a sustainable price. I think very few people think $4 is a sustainable price. Um, so it's a question of how the copper price reacts and when. Um, when you look at the commodity itself, it's no, there's two camps. Uh, there's, there's camp one, which is literally the legacy camp, which thinks that copper is still very much of an industrial metal that's subject to economic recessions and boom-bust cycles. But I, we are very much in the other camp, to be honest, where we feel like it's an energy commodity now, and it's so essential to the energy transition. And when you look at the world, which is short of energy, I think you're going to enter a state for a very long time where people will need to make sure they're overly self-sufficient in energy supplies. And so I think copper's role in, in, the, in the renewables basket will create a much higher floor in terms of demand. And when you look at the challenges of advancing projects, I think you're going to see a lot of pressure upward in the price from both directions. Um, so look, realistically, we don't see 350 as a long-term price, uh, but that's what it is. But in, in, even at this price, our projects still stack up very well. And obviously, what, so it sounds like you've got, like I said earlier, you've got some of the best assets in the world in, in, this, in these commodity spaces that are leveraged to the, to the EV revolution or, or even the energy transition. Um, what's the strategy at the moment? Because you've, you've got all these great assets and they're coming online over the next, say, three to, or four to five years. So towards yeah. the end of the 2020s, you you'll, should have a pretty, pretty healthy balance sheet, yeah. I'd imagine. Um, what, what, what are you doing at the moment to, to just attract additional value for investors? Well, we, we started the company because we saw a chance to create something that you can really only do as a first mover. You can create a highly diversified royalty company with exposure to the best assets out there. Um, that means the tier one assets like Vizcachitas and Takataka Taka and Jose Maria. And that's also very high quality mid-sized assets like Aranza Zoo. Um, what we would love to do right now, and we're seeing more and more opportunities, which is why we're excited to be in this market right now, despite the stress, is that there's opportunities to acquire royalties on cash flowing and near term cash flowing high quality mid sized assets um, to really balance out our cash flow profile. Because when, we, when you look at how we built the company, we sequenced the growth. You know, priority one was, of course, get the, get the big tier ones because they only come once. Um, at the same time, as you saw with the Ranza Zoo, and you'll hope, hopefully see um, as we progress and build the company further, we want to add more near term cash flow from sort of smaller assets that are still very high quality. So we're very focused on that, and we really think it's a great opportunity now. And how, how do you go about that? Are you, is the strategy still to go? away from the mining companies and find those sort of legacy holders mm -hmm. or are you now sort of you've done that and now you you're in a position where you can now start negotiating with some of the other mining companies what what 
How do you go about the, the strategy of actually acquiring new assets? I, I think it, you're definitely beginning to see an evolution there. I, I would say the majority of our business is still very much legacy holders. But because there's been so much stress in the capital markets, we are seeing some very interesting origination opportunities. Yes. And, we, and that's what we expected, to be honest. When you, when you look at the trajectory of the other successful royalty companies, they started out as purely royalty. And then they progressed to origination of royalties and streams. And so I, I don't think Nova will be any different uh, from, that, from that perspective. So we are beginning to see that evolution. And again, I think that capital will not be as freely available in the future as it has been before. And I think with the objective behind building Nova the way we built it is to create something that's highly diversified with top quality exposure, revenue exposure to really some of the most premier minds out there. That creates a very strong entity for people to invest into. Um, if they want to have exposure to any number of things. And so naturally, we feel like over time, we'll emerge as a very attractive investable company, and we'll, have, we'll be able to access capital in better terms than maybe some of the people that we're talking to. So, so we're really excited about what all this means. Well, I think that was one of the things that I found quite interesting as well, was a lot of the people that you did acquire the assets from, or the royalties from originally, they're actually still quite big shareholders Correct. in Nova, right? That's right. And you still have a, a pretty good relationship with them. And so I think, I guess, I guess the idea is that now that you have such a strong foundation of world-class assets, it's then, I guess, like you were saying, it might be now easier for people to buy into this story and, and sort of grow even further. Absolutely. Um, what, what can people be excited for over the next, say, 12 months or so? What, what, is there any catalyst that, other than, obviously, deal flow that hopefully you'll, you might be working on, but anything else that people should be looking out for that, that could, could well, be exciting? Uh, well, I think what... You know, kind of the, the it, it, it's actually pretty well documented in terms of asset progress. All of our assets are actively advancing, from Takataka Taka to Jose Maria, um, to Les Cachitas, um to Copper World, uh, to the Dumont Project, which you know, kind of which, which we own the royalty on the Dumont Project, which is the largest nickel uh, reserve in North America and fully permitted. So we own the royalties and assets that are constantly adding value, which I think is great. And these are the types of assets that add value for a long time. Um, so we'll see, we'll, we'll see how the new slow comes out. Obviously, that's not something we can control, but um, as far as the assets legitimately advancing to our production and adding value, we're very happy with what we see at the moment. Um, and of course, you know, part of the reason why you want to be a public royalty company so you can grow. So is, we, we see great organic growth at the assets. We also see great acquisition growth ahead in terms of being able to add more high quality assets to the portfolio. And again, I mean, we've been very fortunate in that we've done deals with people to acquire royalties and they become meaningful shareholders of the company. That happened in Takataka, Taka, that happened in Dumont, that happened in Copper World. Um, and, you know, it's really something, you know, that we, that we appreciate very much. So hopefully we can find more of those where people really want to be a part of the company and there's a, there's a win-win deal. You know, the, one of the things that I'm really proud of is people come back. You know, we do the first deal with them, then, we, then they do a second deal with us. And that's the biggest compliment you can get, that people want to come back and do business with you on something that it's very important and personal to them. So, so we're, we're very excited about the next 12 months, for sure. Awesome. Um, Alex, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Peter.